uh, we can, we can uh, get two rules for worship out of this. The first rule is called, um, I'll call the rule of self-offering. The rule of self-offering. Okay, if you love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Okay, you're going to offer your whole self to God. Is that going to include your racial, ethnic identity? Who you are, your family stories, your people's history? the color of your hair, the shape of your nose, your heart language, the food, your, the comfort food, the food that says home to you. Is that part of your self-offering? If you're going to love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, is that going to include all that stuff? I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. That's a huge part of every one of us. A huge part of every one of us. For that uh, Hapa woman in the house church, uh, house worship setting, that was half of her that was missing, right, at that setting, the Asian half of her. You know, love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, your whole uh, being. Make it your, your best self-offering. So, for instance, when it comes to music, let's say music and worship, uh, there is a place for music to really be the music of your generation, the music of your background, your people, the music that, that, that is your voice. You know, in some churches right now, there are debates about, we had a little hip-hop last night, a little spoken <laughs> rap in, uh, in, the, in the opening worship. And in some churches, they debate this, you know, because, well, hip-hop is gangster music, and, you know, and it's misogynistic and all these things. It doesn't belong in the church. You know, well, the, you know I'm old enough, I remember all the debates about guitars. Oh, guitars are, you know, rock and roll, and that's evil, and we can't have that, and then drums in the church, oh, that's terrible. I remember all that debate. And, um, and this, you know, there, there are real things to talk about. It's not just, you know, it's, it's, um, there are real issues to talk about with all these things. But still, you know, every generation has its own voice in music. And if you're going to make a full self-offering, then that should be your voice. That should be your generation's voice. You know, and every generation's voice is specially gifted to say certain things. You know, hip-hop is a language is a music of protest. It's an angry voice. And you think about all the things in Scripture that are protesting. And you think about the, the Hebrew prophets saying, you know, you know they condemn the, the unrighteous and they condemn, you know, injustice. Well, that would be a great, you know, great, um, um, uh, a great theme for a, a hip-hop adaptation. Or you think of Jesus, you know, condemning, you know, the seven woes. Woe to you Pharisees and scribes, you whitewashed, you know, tombs, you know, you load up people with burdens they cannot carry and don't, you know, lift a finger to help them. And they go on and Jesus just sticks it to them. I mean, that's a total hip-hop kind of, you know, message, totally. And so um, every generation has a voice, has a voice that's particularly good at expressing certain things. Um, you know, my parents' generation growing up with hymns, growing up in a, in a world that was more orderly and where you trusted the government and, you know, all those things. You know, um, you know their music, their voice is much more predictable and much more um, uh, steady and much more uh, um, uh, 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 traditional. And that, that expresses certain truths that are important too, right? Those are important too. So... So it is. Every generation has its own voice in music and, and in all these other ways. Uh, in worship, we make our best self-offering. But you saw the, uh, the second commandment as well, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, so the rule of self-offering and right next to it, the rule of self-sacrifice. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, that's, that's actually quite a contrast, right? Because this one is about loving yourself it says love, you, and the second one is love your neighbor as yourself. Now notice, Jesus assumes, uh, Jesus lets you love yourself. Jesus does not ask you to hate yourself, right? Jesus assumes that you will love yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus wants you to accept yourself and to love yourself and love your culture and love the shape of your nose and to love the color of your hair and the texture of your hair and to love your ancestry and to love your people. He wants you to love yourself, but he wants you to love your neighbor as yourself. Right? And to love your neighbor as yourself, you're going to have to sometimes make self-sacrifice. And so music, once again, music. Um, you know, we almost have this idea that 
this unspoken rule that everyone on Sunday morning, on Sunday morning, everyone should get the music they like. Well, that doesn't really sound like anything in the Bible. <laughs> the Bible doesn't have a say. Every Sunday morning, everyone should have music they like. No. Uh, that's more of a, a consumer, you know, get into the car and tune the channel, the word, you know, what you like. You get on your iPod and, and uh, listen to the music you like. And on Sunday morning, there is a space for that, the music you like, the music that is your voice, that, is your, that speaks from your heart, uh, the rule of self-offering. But as well, the rule of self-sacrifice. So, for instance, I had a pastor friend who uh, would lead music at his church, and he would have to pick the hymns. He would pick the songs for Sunday morning. And he would always pick certain hymns that he knew people liked and would really speak to their heart and encourage them, even though he hated them. <laughs> certain, certain, I won't name them, but you know, certain hymns he just hated. And he, but he would play them. He would lead them because, he, because self-sacrifice, right? He's loving his neighbor as himself. You know, if the church had more of this, then we wouldn't have these fights over music, right? Uh, because uh, we would both be lifting up our own voices and helping each other uh, lift up their voices. Okay, let's see what we're done. Okay. The whole uh, cultural trajectory in Scripture um, is very dramatic. It's very, very dramatic. So if you think, oh, how did I get there? Okay. <laughs> Give away my joke. <laughs> um, you think about uh, in the book of Acts, uh, the book of Acts chapter 10, uh, book of Acts chapter 10, and you know the story of Peter and Cornelius, right? Peter and Cornelius. So Peter, one day, he's, uh, he's after lunch, and he's uh, sleepy. I know how this feels. Also, I'm so glad this is not an afternoon session, because I would just be out. It's very sleepy. And uh, he has this dream, right? And he sees all these animals coming down from heaven, all these pigs and ducks and, and uh, snakes and different things. Ah, sounds like a Chinese butcher shop. So <laughs> Peter sees this, uh, all these animals, and they're not kosher. And Peter's a nice Jewish boy, right? Nice Jewish boy. A good Jew, you know, like Peter, never ate non-kosher food like pork. He probably had never stepped foot in a Gentile house before. He would never even go inside a Gentile house because that would make him unclean, right? So you don't eat non-kosher food, don't even step in a Gentile house. And he has this vision from God that, um, uh, you know, of all these animals that are not kosher. And the voice says, kill and eat. And Peter says, no way, God, as if, you know, I mean, there is... Uh, I've never, I, I don't know about you, if you've ever been in a situation where there's food that's been served to you that you really do not want to eat because it's just, you don't eat that. Uh, for me, it's chicken feet. You know, chicken feet, so my, my and duck feet. My, my, we go to dim sum, right, uh, dim sum with my family. And my kids, uh, my wife, they love the duck feet, the duck feet. This is one of the best, this is one of the few, the most successful exports from the United States to China is uh, chicken feet. Because, you know, we don't eat chicken feet here. In China, they love it. Big exports. Out of Oakland, actually. So, I, 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 you know, I tell them, if you're going to order the duck feet, warn me. So I, don't, so I know not to look. So I don't even want to see it. I don't even want to look at it. It's like, ah, yuck, I don't, I don't want to see this. And here they are, mm, mm, spitting out the bones, you know, and oh. Yikes. And to even put it in your mouth, it's like, ah. Well, this was Peter, right, thinking about this non-kosher food. But even, even stronger, because I, I don't like duck feet, because I just, aesthetically, I don't know. I don't know why I don't like it. But Peter, for Peter, this is religious conviction, right? God said, don't touch that unclean food. And, and he'd not, he hadn't all his whole life, right? And yet this vision from God of these you know, pork chops and whatnot, and, and so, and the voice from heaven says, do not call anything impure that God has made clean, right? Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Well, what is, what is the anything that God is making clean in this story? Well, you know the story. Cornelius, who is this Italian, this European, uh, bad guy, European Romans, boo, right? 
And, but, he's a, but he's a God-fearer, and uh, God wants to tell him about Jesus. And he wants Peter to, to be the messenger. And so uh, he tells Cornelius to call for Peter, and he prepares Peter to go to Cornelius' house. Now, two things to notice there. One thing is, notice that Cornelius is a very, he's a very good citizen. He's a very good person. You know, if he lived in your neighborhood, you would think of him and say, oh, yeah, he's the kind of guy that always supports, you know, the nonprofit, uh, good work, and he sponsors the school, and he gives money to the Red Cross, and, you know, he does all these good things for our community. He's a very good man, right? And yet, he needs Jesus too, right? So some people think it's, good en it's enough to be a good person. Well, no, Cornelius was a good person, and it was not enough. He still needed Jesus. Secondly, note that um, God asked Peter to go to Cornelius' house. Now, it would have been just as easy. It would have been easier, actually. It would have been much easier if God asked Cornelius to go to Peter's house, right? Could have done the same thing, right? Could have asked Cornelius to go to Peter's house. Okay, Cornelius, you Gentile, you're going to hear about Jesus, and I want you to go to the house of this Jew, and he's going to tell you about Jesus, right? Could have done that. Just as easy, easier, even easier. But no, he wants Peter, the Jew, to go to Cornelius' house. Right? And tells Peter, don't call anything impure that God has made clean. Well, what is the anything? What is God making clean in this story? What is God making clean? It's Gentile culture. It's your culture and my culture that God is making clean, Gentile culture. He wants Peter to go to that house, and maybe they take their shoes off, and maybe they don't, and maybe, they, uh, maybe the men and the women greet each other, maybe they don't. Maybe, um, uh, maybe the kids are supposed to greet visitors, and maybe they don't. Maybe you sit on the floor, maybe you sit on a chair. Uh, maybe you eat with a fork and knife, maybe you eat with chopsticks. Maybe you wash your hands first, maybe you don't, you know? And he wants Peter to sit down and eat that pork chop dinner, you know? And tell these people about Jesus. That's crazy. That is really, really crazy. That is, you know, shocking that God's plan comes to this point. We can think of it this way. Uh, so back in the Old Testament, before the time of Jesus, uh, the cultural trajectory of God's plan was centripetal. Centripetal means motion or energy towards the center, right, to the center. So back in the Old Testament, anyone could become a believer. Anyone could become a believer, but you have to become culturally Jewish. Anyone could become a believer, but you have to be culturally Jewish. So you think about, let's say, Ruth, right, Ruth, who's a Moabitess. She's from Moab. She's not a Jew. But she marries into a Jewish family, and there's, uh, there's some deaths in the family, and she finally tells her mother-in-law, I will go with your people, and your people will be my people, right? And so on. And part of this means I'm going to keep cooking Jewish food. <laughs> you know, I'm going to keep worshiping the Jewish God. And physically, I'm even going to move for you. And so anyone could become a believer, but you had to become culturally Jewish. And so here's a model of the temple. This is actually in, Israel, in Jerusalem. You can go see it. A model of the temple. And so you know, to become a believer, it was even geographically focused and centered. You know, if you wanted to come worship, you had to come to this place, right, this temple to worship. Um, and it's in a certain place where they speak a certain language and eat a certain food. You know, it's part of a certain culture. And so uh, anyone could become a believer but you had to become culturally Jewish, culturally Jewish to, to do so. Then comes Jesus, then comes Peter and Cornelius, and suddenly the trajectory goes 180 degrees out. Instead of a centripetal trajectory culturally, where everyone can become a believer, but you had to become culturally Jewish, now, culturally, anyone can become a believer in their own culture in their own culture. That's huge. It's crazy. If you follow it from Acts 10 to Acts 15, um, from Acts 10 to Acts 15, 
uh, it's really a very dramatic story. You know, we get to the Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council, right? They have to make a decision about whether uh, Gentile believers have to be circumcised. You know, that's part of this whole same discussion. And the Jerusalem Council took a very radical, actually very liberal, politically liberal um, decision to say, no, they don't have to be circumcised. And this is very, very risky, you know, for the, for the Jerusalem Council to decide um, with those who said, you don't have to be circumcised. It's, more, it's okay to be a Gentile. It's okay to be a Gentile. This is politically very risky for them because this, this makes them smell like they care about Romans, and this makes them less loyal as Jews. They seem less loyal as Jews. And they took that risk. They took that risk for the sake of Gentile uh, believers. And so this uh, centri centrifugal cultural trajectory, uh, uh, declaring all things clean, uh, to say that you, know, you can become a believer in any culture, and, and uh, be a follower of Jesus. This is very, very radical. You know, this even comes to things like, you know, translations of the Bible, right? The fact that we have the Bible in Korean, in English, in Samoan, and so on, so on, so on. That's part of this, right? If you go to Friday prayers in a mosque, if you're a Muslim, you go to Friday prayers, you hear the Quran read. I don't care if you're in Chicago, Illinois, or if you're in Mecca, or if you're in Indonesia, or wherever you are, you go to Friday prayers, you hear the Quran read, what language is it read in? Arabic, classical, not just modern Arabic, classical Arabic. Everywhere you go in the world, always. And uh, that's a centripetal trajectory, right? Anyone can come to Friday prayers, but you gotta hear the <laughs> Quran in classical Arabic. Um, uh, for Christians, uh, starting in um, with the Jerusalem Council, and then especially after the Reformation, if you know your church history, uh, uh, Professor Tim can uh, bone you up on church history. And, uh, you know, Martin Luther reinforcing the idea that you know, worshipers should be able to worship in their own language. And so uh, the idea that you can read the Bible in your own language is part of this, you know, that, that English and Korean and Chinese and all these languages are clean. They are clean uh, when it comes to expressing uh, the gospel. And so it is that we have all these different cultures, and we need all these different cultures. Worship is kind of like food. Food always comes in a cultural package, right? The food we had last night, yum, 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 yum. The adobo chicken and all the different food we had last night, right? It's all these different foods that come from different cultures. You can't just eat, you know, carbohydrates. Well, let's have some carbohydrates for dinner. Let's have some protein for dinner. No, it always comes in a cultural form. Right, and that's why we enjoy it. That's why we love it. Okay, so here's a Vietnamese sandwich, banh mi, right? This is actually a really fancy one, right? Look at all that. Wow. <laughs> uh, in Oakland, where I'm from, Oakland, California, you can get banh mi. Lots of Vietnamese uh, restaurants where you can get a banh mi sandwich. And banh mi is great. The bread is always super fresh. Um, you get, you know, all your food groups there. You get your meat, your carbohydrate, your vegetables, all there, you know, in one, one meal. And they, they tend to be very inexpensive. You get a good banh mi sandwich for three bucks, you know, just three dollar sandwich, and it's fresh and it's yummy, and it's uh, it's all uh, all good. So in Oakland, we really love these. Okay, so you look at this, and you got you got your carbohydrates, you got your protein, you got your vegetables, you got your fat, um, all good, all good. But there's actually a whole cultural identity and a whole story here, right? So this banh mi, why, why is it on a French roll? Why is, it on a, why is the bread a French roll? It's because of the French, the French occupation of Indochina, right? French Indochina, before the Americans were there, the French were there uh, for many years. They had a very bad experience. It ended very badly. That's why the Americans came along. Uh, but a lot of uh, Vietnamese food now is influenced by the years of French occupation, including this French roll. Um, you look at the vegetables, the mint, and so forth, the basil, um, uh, things that you can grow in a place like Vietnam. Uh, why, is, why is this easy to find in Oakland, California? You know, that's a long ways from Vietnam. <laughs> Oakland, why is it easy to get a banh mi in Oakland, California? It's because of the American War in Vietnam, right? 
and which ended badly and all the vietnamese who came here who were our allies and ended up here in america uh, by choice or by necessity and ended up here uh, doing things like running restaurants and um, and so there's a whole story right there's a whole journey just in this lunch um, food always comes in a cultural package and so it is with um, Worship. So it is with worship as well. Worship always comes in a cultural, cultural package. Uh, one of the parts of being, um, of encountering culture is, to encounter culture, you have to be comfortable with the body. The body, right? Because uh, the body is how we experience culture. Um, and as Christians, American Christians, and as Protestants especially, uh, we're a little uncomfortable with the body. We don't know quite what to do with the body in worship. And therefore, sometimes we're a little uncomfortable with what to do with culture in worship. But in our Greek heritage, we do have this idea that, you know, ideas and truth and the spiritual is more important. Even actually what we're doing right now, actually what we're doing right now, right now, this moment, is a very Greek exercise. You know, you're sitting very quietly, not really doing much bodily, except trying to stay awake. <laughs> I'm with you, man. I feel you. Um, and I'm here, you know, launching ideas into the air, putting images on the screen. That's a very Greek, that's a very Greek exercise. You know, we're not out there doing worship. We're not, we're not bodily doing stuff. You know, we're talking about ideas, and that's a Greek approach. And that's not all bad. There's a place for that. Uh, we use that. Places like universities, University of Chicago, you know, very Greek. Uh, sometimes even in the architecture, you know. But, um, but when it comes to worship, I think this can hinder us because we get this idea that the spiritual matters more than the physical. Another obstacle, um, okay, let's talk about this. Uh, sometimes we can look at certain passages and get this idea that the spiritual is more important than the physical. And um, I think we can read them differently. So you remember John 4. Jesus meets the woman at the well. Um, they have this discussion about her marriages and so on and so forth. And they get into this discussion about where to worship. And, and so she's Samaritan in what's now the West Bank, right? And there are two rival temples. One is in Jerusalem, one is in Mount Gerizim. And the Samaritans say the, the true temple is Mount Gerizim, and the Jews say the true temple is in Jerusalem. And there's actually a, a temple still there today on Mount Gerizim. And the Samaritans actually still have, uh, do animal sacrifice. They still do the Passover with the lamb and the blood and everything. Uh, the Jews, of course, the temple was destroyed, right, by the Romans. And so they can't uh, do that anymore. Um, but at that time, when Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman, there's this debate, which is the right temple? Which is the right temple? Where did your body have to be to worship properly? Does your body have to be in Jerusalem, or is it going to be in Mount Gerizim? Right? This is the question. Which is the right temple? This is the question she asks him. And the answer Jesus gives, uh, time is coming, has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father see. God is spirit, and his worshipers much worship in spirit and in truth. Spirit and in truth. And I think there's two ways to take this passage. Uh, worship in spirit and in truth, you could take that in the Greek sense. The Greek sense is, okay, so true worship is this kind of inward, closed eye, you know, spiritual, quiet. That's true worship. Spirit, you know, I'm thinking the right thoughts, I'm thinking the right thoughts about God spirit and in truth. That's one way to take it. I think that's the wrong way. Because remember, what's the question? The question is, where should your body be to worship? Mount Gerizim or Jerusalem? Where should your, what's the right place for your body to be? And Jesus is saying, it doesn't matter where your body is now. Your body can be anywhere and you can worship as long as you worship in spirit and truth. He's not saying the body doesn't matter. He's saying the body can be anywhere. The body can be in Chicago, Illinois, <laughs> right? And you can worship just as well as if you were in Jerusalem or Mount Gerizim or anywhere else. Uh, this is how things have changed. 
the, the cultural geographical trajectory, no longer centripetal, pointing to Jerusalem and Jewish culture, but now it's centrifugal, pointing to all places, all peoples, everywhere. Uh, worship in spirit and in truth, anywhere. Your body can be anywhere and you can be a worshiper. Uh, likewise, uh, I'll tell you this story. So, uh, some years ago, I was able to travel to uh, uh, Israel and, uh, and the Palestinian territories. And I was able to visit the uh, Church of the Nativity there in Bethlehem. So, there in Bethlehem is the Church of the Nativity, uh, where historically there's a pretty, you know, there's a pretty good case. We can't know for sure, for sure, but a pretty good case. This is where Jesus was born. This was the case. These were the caves where, you know, the manger and everything. And historically, you know, this place has a better, there's a better case for this place than anywhere else. Okay, so you go to the Church of the Nativity, and, and uh, you go inside the church, and underneath there's a, there's a little area underneath the altar, and this is the very spot. This is the very, very spot where Mary took the baby and laid him in a manger, uh, right there. And the spot is marked with a silver star, and different Christians from different traditions take care of this church and this altar, and, they, um, and there it is, the place where Jesus was born. Um, okay, so there I am uh, with uh, some seminary classmates, and we're all Protestant Christians, and we're visiting the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. And we go to this very place. Wow, this very place where our Savior was born, where he was incarnated and born, right? Here, this physical place. Okay, so we go there, and we're standing there. And while we're standing there, different uh, local worshipers and pilgrims are coming in, and they are coming to worship. They come there, they kneel, they make a sign of the cross, they pray, light a candle, you know, something like that, right? And we're standing there, good American Protestant Christians. And what are we doing? What are we doing? This very place where our Savior was born. What are we doing? Taking pictures. We're taking pictures. <laughs> taking pictures, right? which is a modern technological ritual, right? And actually, in some ways, you could say we're trying to do the same thing as the worshipers. We are trying to honor this place and kind of bring into our own lives some of the specialness of this place. And they're doing it through acts of Christian worship, and we're doing it through this technology and this, you know, that. Which is to say, these worshipers had a much more embodied sense of worship than we did, right? We had a technological sense of maybe worship, I don't know. They had a fully embodied historical sense of worship. And part of the reason why we as uh, Protestants sometimes uh, uh, hesitate about this or have a hard time with this is um, Reformation residue. So during the Reformation, you know, Martin Luther and all that, some, some of the Protestants felt like, well, if the Catholics do it, it's bad and we're not going to do it. So if the Catholics wear robes, or if the Catholics cross themselves, or if the Catholics, you know, do whatever, then we're not going to do it, because we're not them. Yeah, out group, in group, right? And so that infects us to this day. You know, there are Protestant churches where, like the church where I grew up, you know, I showed you this church. You know, we don't light candles, we don't cross ourselves, we don't kneel, you know, because that's what Catholics do. You know, but pretty soon you're not doing anything, right? Pretty soon you're, you know, maybe you're standing and sitting. Maybe you're clapping, maybe, you know. But pretty soon you're not doing anything, you know. And crossing yourself, actually, that's a much more ancient um, symbol than what we know of as Roman Catholicism. Actually, now today I do cross myself. Um, I actually, at some point I ran into a Greek Orthodox priest, a Greek Orthodox priest, and he taught me how to cross myself the Orthodox way, which is different than the Catholic way. So Catholics... They use their fingertips. It's up, down, left, right, I think. Yes. Any former Catholics here? Up, down, left, right. Okay, the Orthodox do it differently. They hold their hands like this. Try it. Hold your hands like that. Three fingers, two fingers. Does that remind you of any theology? Three fingers, two fingers. Three fingers, two fingers. Trinity, three fingers. The two natures of Christ, fully human and fully divine, right? Fully God, fully man. Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, two natures of Christ, fully God, fully man. That's the whole Christian theology right there, right? There it is, Christian theology right in your hand. 
And they cross themselves up, down, right, left, center. Okay, up, down, right, left, center, which is different than Catholic, which is up, down, left, right. Okay, and so he taught me that, and I thought, that's cool, I like that, I could do that. And so probably three years ago, I started doing that, and now this is what I do. When I take communion, last night when I took communion in our service, I crossed myself uh, at funerals, you know, when I approach the deceased, I cross myself, you know, different things like that. I, I cross myself, and it's like, this is my bodily act of worship. And, um, and so I think if we get past some of these, uh, these battles, these Reformation battles, uh, it can really help us. And I really sense that among you. You're, you guys are more comfortable than a lot of groups I've been with when it comes to just being embodied and having a sense of bodily presence and bodily uh, energy. Okay, let me uh, just mention one last uh, obstacle and we'll wrap up for today. Uh, regulative Biblicism. Okay, that's a big mouthful. Um, <clears throat> And we'll talk about this more tomorrow. But if you're gonna if you're gonna plan worship, if you're gonna plan worship, how do you use the Bible to plan worship? Is the Bible a cookbook? Is the Bible a cookbook for worship? Okay, start here, put this here, this is what comes next, then do this. Is the Bible a cookbook for worship? Uh, not really. Not really. And we'll talk about this more tomorrow. But some people, they think, well, yeah, you know, well, God, the Bible is God's word, so we should just only do what the Bible says. And so if it doesn't say to do it in the Bible, we shouldn't do it. And so if the Bible doesn't say to, I don't know, whatever, if the Bible doesn't say to have a procession, then we shouldn't have a procession, you know. And so uh, this approach to worship planning, it's called the regulative approach, to only do what the Bible says and not do anything the Bible doesn't say. Uh, can also be an obstacle to embodied faith because the Bible actually doesn't say the Bible doesn't say to use musical instruments, right? And actually, your sister movement, Churches of Christ, uh, some of them have made this choice to not use musical instruments, and we have the freedom to do that. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, but uh, some traditions they say, well, you know, um, you know, the Bible doesn't tell you to, to do gestures in worship, and so we shouldn't do those, you know. And, and pretty soon, you're not doing very much. And so this whole idea of regulative uh, biblicism, when it comes to worship planning, when it comes to worship planning, uh, can also become an obstacle to embodied faith. As we talk tomorrow, I'll talk more about the Bible. It's more of a, it's more of a, it tells us about the object of our worship. The Bible is about the object of our worship and not the details of our worship, not the forms of worship. It's, it's more, it's more of a portrait and less of a cookbook and, um, and so uh, as we keep this portrait in mind of Jesus, God revealed to us in the person of Jesus, uh, um, we'll talk tomorrow about how God wants us to use our creativity and our culture in approaching worship.